Chapter Eighteen of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen, Doctor Seward's Diary, Thirtieth of September. I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived but had already studied the transcript of the various diaries and letters which Harker and his wonderful wife had made and arranged. Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that for the first time since I have lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her. There was no possible reason why I should. So I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that the lady would like to see him. To which she simply answered, why? She's going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in by all means. Just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared or was jealous of some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment, I thought that he might have some homicidal intent. I remember how quiet he had been before he attacked me in my own study. I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is the one of the qualities mad people most respect. Good evening, Mr. Renfield, said she. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you. He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead. Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh, now I have a husband of my own, to whom I was married, before I ever saw Dr. Seward. Oh, he, me. I am Mrs. Harker. And what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then don't stay. But why not? I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker, any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous. Given in a pause, in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question. I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, while championing me. He replied to her that with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in a mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the errors of non causa and ignoratio relenti. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I have ever met with, talking elemental philosophy and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory, if his new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence. She must have some rare gift of power. We continued to talk for some time, 
and seeing that it was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began, to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that, by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly we actually try to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out. On that one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood. Relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life. Though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarised a truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I'd seen him eat up his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once, after saying pleasantly to Miss Renfield, Goodbye. I hope I may see you often. Under auspices, pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he had been since Lucy first took ill. And Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed to me, saying, Ah, friend John, how goes all? Well, so I've been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madam Mina is with you? Yes. And her so fine husband? And Arthur and my friend Quincy? They are with you too? Good. As I drove to the house, I told him what had passed and how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madam Mina, she has a man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose. Believe me when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After tonight, she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. Is it not good that she run a risk so great? We men are determined, nay, we are we not pledged to destroy this monster. But it is no part for a woman, even if she be not harmed. Her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer, both in waking from her nerves and in sleep from her dreams. Besides, she's a young woman and not so long married. There may be other things to think of sometime, if not now. You tell me she's wrote all and she must consult with us, but tomorrow she say goodbye to this work and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and great concern seemed to come on him. Oh, that we had known it before, he said. For then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that. Go on our way to the end. Then he fell into a silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? 
We have seen hitherto how good light and all the things have been made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worse for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from her pocket, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this? And tell me if it must go in. It is my record of today. I too have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial. But there is little in this except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, for I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more, and all of us, your friends, more honour to you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush and a bright smile. And so now, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner, before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, and when we meet in the study, we shall be informed as to facts and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th of September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after the dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Housing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the Professor and Dr. Seward in the centre. The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we're all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. We all expressed assent and he went on. And I think it were, I think it good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me, so we can then discuss how we shall act and can take our measure accordingly. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have the evidence that they exist, even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience. The teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane people. I admit that the first time I was sceptic, were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind. I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove, alas, had I known at the first what I now know, nay, had even guessed at him, one so precious a life that would have been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone and we must so work. The other poor souls perish not, whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting ones. He is only stronger, and being stronger, have yet more power to work evil. This vampire, which is amongst us, is of himself, so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, or his cunning be the growth of ages. He have still the age of necromancy, which is, as his entomology implied, a divination by the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh are for him to command. He is brute, and more than brute, he is devil in callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within limitations, appear at will, where and when, and in any of the forms that are to him. He can, with his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder, he can command the meaner things, the rat, the owl and the bat, the moth and the fox and the wolf. He can grow and become small. He can at times vanish and become unknown. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where? And having found it, how can we destroy it? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake. And there may be consequences to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win. And then where end we? Life is nothings. I heed him not. But the fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him. And that we henceforward 
become foul things of the night, like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us, forever, are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time, abhorred by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case must we shrink. For me, I say no, but then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his songs of birds, his music and his love, lie far behind. You others are young, some have seen sorrow, there are fair days yet in store, what say you? While he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him, when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the Professor had done speaking, my husband looked at my eyes, and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself, he said. Count me in, Professor, said Mr Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr Seward simply nodded. The professor stood up, and after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand either side. I took his right hand, Lord Gollum with his left. Jonathan held my right with his left and stretched across to Mr Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart go icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We returned to our places, and Dr Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely and in as business-like a way as any other transaction of life. Well, you know that we have to contend against, but we too are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science, are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and night are ours, equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in the cause, and an end to achieve which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot in fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much, when the matter of one is of life and death, nay, of more than either life or death, yet we must be satisfied in the first place, because we have to be. No other means is at our control. And, secondly, because, after all, these things, tradition and superstition, are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not, alas, for us on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility in the midst of our scientific and sceptical matter-of-fact 19th century? We even scouted in the belief what we saw justified under our own very eyes. Take it then that the vampire and the belief in his limitations and his cure rest for the moment on the same base. For let me tell you he is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourish in Germany, all over, in France, in India, even in the Chernobyl and in China. So far from us in all ways. There even is he, and the people's fear at him this day. He had followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon. And let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so 
unhappy experience. The vampire lives on and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can grow younger and his vital faculties grow strenuous and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pebblum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet and he eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him to eat, never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observed. He has the strength of many of his hand. Witness again Jonathan here. When he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too, he can transform himself into a wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog. He can be as a bat, as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create. That noble ship's captain proved him of this. But, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and can only be round himself. He come on moonlit rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He become so small, we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hairbreadth space at the tomb door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound, or even fused up with fire. Solder, you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which one is half shut from the light. But hear me through, he can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, and the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why, we know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be someone of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come and go as he please. His power ceases as to that of all evil things at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom, if he be not at the place where he is bound, and only change himself at noon or at exact sunrise or sunset. These things we are told. And in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as well as he will within his limit, when he have his earthly home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide in Whitby, still at other time he can only change when the time come. It is said too that he can only pass running water at the slack or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for the thing sacred as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now, when we resolved to them, he is nothing, and in their presence he takes his place far off and silent with respect. There are others too which I shall tell you of, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of a wild rose on his coffin, keep him that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin, kill him so that he can be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut off of the head that give us rest. We have seen it with our eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him. If we obey what we know that he is clever, I have asked my friend Amenius of Budapest University to make his record, and from all means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must indeed have been that Volvo Dracula who won his name against the Turk over the great river on the very frontier of Turkey land. If it be so, then he was no common man, for in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, 
as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain, that iron resolution, went with him to his grave, and even now are arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race. Now and again there were Scions who were held by their Cobials to have dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Shalomans, among the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Strogosia, Witch, Ordog and Poco, Satan and Hell. And in one manuscript, this very Dracula is spoken of as a vampire, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man and good woman and their graves made sacred the earth, where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In the soil, barren of holy memories, it cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came 50 boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. And it seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house, beyond that wall where we look today or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace. Here we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside of the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which, ricocheting from the top of the embrasure, struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid, I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet, Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr Morris's voice without. Sorry, I fear I've alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it. A minute later he came in and said, That was an idiotic thing for me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is, whilst the professor was talking, there came a big bat and sat on the windowsill. Got such a horror of the damn brutes from recent events, I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing late of evenings, whenever I've seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art. Did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. I don't know. I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair. Or we must, so to speak, sterilise the earth so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus in the end we may find him in his form of a man between the hours of noon and sunset and so engage with him when he's at his most weak. And now for you, Madam Mina, this night is the end until all be well. You're too precious to have such a risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men and able to bear, but you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in the danger, such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved, but it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger, and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up, and though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow, save nothing, it's safe to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr Morris resumed the discussion. And there is no time to lose. I vote we have a look at this house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close. But I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared to be a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their councils altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax with means to get into the house.
Man like there told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st of October, 4am Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, and he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. Don't know about what. If you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause, so I said, All right, I'll go now, and asked the others to wait a few minutes for me as I had to go and see my patient. Take me with you, friend John, said the professor. This case in your diary interests me much, and it had bearing too, now and again in our case. I should like very much to see him, and especially when his mind is disturbed. May I come also, asked Lord Godalming. Me too, said Quincy Morris. May I come, said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I have met with in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with the others entirely sane. We all four went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and adduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment. And beside, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr Renfield. We shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I have the honour of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, much patronised on Derby night. Mr Morris, you should be proud of your great state, which reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effect hereafter, and the Pole and the Tropics may hold alliance to the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement when the Monroe Doctrine takes its place at a political table. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionised therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You gentlemen who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world. I take to witness that I am as sane as at least the majority of men, who are in full possession of their liberties. I am sure that you, Dr Seward, humanitarian and medico jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made his last appeal with a curtly air of conviction, which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored. And I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement. 
for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, you hardly appreciate my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scythe man, it is of the essence of the contract. I'm sure it is only necessary, but for so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward, so simple and so momentous a wish, to ensure its fulfilment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing that the negatives in my face turned to the others and scrutinised them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on. Is it possible that I've erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, boon, privilege, what you will. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones. Sound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart? you would approve to the full sentiments which animate me. Nay more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friend. Again he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another form or phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows always meeting with a fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as one addressing an equal. Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy me, a stranger without prejudice without the habit of keeping open mind. Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk, and on his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret in his face, the Professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete. If I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. But I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave. So I went towards the door simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared that he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploring me and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was mitigating against him by restoring us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes. So I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him when he had to make some request, of which at the time he had thought much. 
Such, for instance, when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realised, for when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees, held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. Oh, let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away, how you will and where you will, and send keepers with me, with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacle and leg iron, even to a jail, but let me get out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I'm speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know to whom you wrong or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By you all hold sacred, you all hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives. For the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn, don't you know that I am sane and earnest now? And I'm no lunatic in a mad fit but a sane man fighting for his soul. Oh, hear me, hear me, let me go, let me go, let me go. I thought the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this. We've had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intensely for several moments, and then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, the last of our party, he said to me in a well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind later that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Jonathan Harker's Journal. 1st of October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I'm so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all. But now that her work is done, and that it is due to her energy, brains and foresight, that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells. She may well feel that her part is finished, and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, a little upset by the scene with Mr Renfield. When we came away from his room we were silent, till we got back to the study. And Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he's about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. I'm not sure, but I believe that he had some serious purpose, and if he had it, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent, Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more of lunatics than I do, and I'm glad of it. I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would, before that last hysterical outburst, have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task, we must take no chance. As my friend Quincy would say, all is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know, but that I agree with you. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him, but he seems so mixed up with accounting and indexy kind of way that I'm afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed, with almost equal fervour for a cat, and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master. 
and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. The horrid thing is the wolves and the rats and his own kind to help, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly seemed to be in earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things, in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand, help to unnerve a man. The Professor stepped over and, laying his hand on his shoulder, said in his grave, kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case. We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for except the pity of the good God? Lord Godalming has slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle as he remarked, that old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way into the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the Professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need the arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men. And though our necks and our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable, his are not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man or body of men, more strong in all of him, can at certain times hold him but they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. And he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife, and for aid in all, these so small electric lamps as you can fasten to your breast, and for all and above and all the last this, which we must not desecrate needless. It was a portion of a sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? So that we can open the door, we need not break house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit. After a little play back and forward, the bolt yielded with a rusty clang. It shot back. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Miss Westenra's tomb. I fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. The professor was the first to move and stepped into the door. In manus tuus domine, he said, crossing himself as he passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within, should we be in a hurry making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell on all sorts of odd forms as the rays crossed each other, or the opacity of our bodies threw great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps, in which, on holding down my lamp, I could see the marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spiders' webs. 
whereupon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags, as the weight of them had torn them partly down. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with time-yellowed label on each. They had been used several times, but on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it. You know at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel? I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it. I led the way and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. This is the spot, said the professor, as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house copy from a file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps, but none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the count at all at close quarters. When I had seen him, he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or when he was gloated with fresh blood. In a ruined building, open to the air, but here the place was small and close. And the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, as if some dry miasma which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality and with the pungent, acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. Fah, it sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances, such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end. But this was no ordinary case the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent of the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work, as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the earth's chests were bulky and there was no mistaking them. There were only 29 left out of the 50. Once I got a fright, or seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door, into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the high lights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows and resumed his inquiry. I turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding place, even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination and said nothing. A few minutes later I saw Morris suddenly step back from a corner. Which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorus which twinkled like the stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door, which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge 
bolts and swung the door open. Then taking out his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs. And after about a minute, three terriers came dashing around the corner of the house. Unconsciously, we had all moved towards the door. And as we moved, I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way. But even in the minute that had elapsed, the number of rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, and then simultaneously lifting their noses began to howl in the most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs and, carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground, he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs who had now been lifted in the same manner had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going, it seemed as if some evil presence had departed, for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes, turning them over and over and tossed them into the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise, whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere or the opening of the chapel door, or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open, I know not. But most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door and barred and locked it, and bringing the dogs with us began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout, except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched, save for my own footsteps when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel, they frisked about as though they had been rabbit hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east, and when we emerged from the front, Dr Van Helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. So far, he said, our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us, such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all, I do rejoice that this our first, and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous step, has been accomplished, without the bringing therein to of our most sweet Madam Mina, or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson too we have learned, if it be allowable to argue a particularly, that the brute beasts which are to the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spirit power. For look, the rats that would have come to his call, just as from his castle top, he summoned the wolves to your going and to that poor mother's cry. Though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the little dogs of my friend Arthur. We have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears. And that monster, he has not used his power over the brute world for only the last time tonight. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us an opportunity to cry check in some ways in this chess game which we play for the sake of human souls. Now let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our first night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril, but we must go on, and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away, in one of the distant wards, and a low moaning sound from Renfield's room. The 
poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into our own room and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful she is to be left out of our future work and even of our deliberations. It's too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore, I'm glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her, if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth, our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at least such times as we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the netherworld. I dare say it would be difficult to begin to keep silence after such confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and tomorrow I shall keep dark over tonight's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her. 1st of October, later. I suppose it was natural that we should all have overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt its exhaustion, although I slept till the sun was high. I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognise me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror, as one looks who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We now know of 21 boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken in any of these removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will of course immensely simplify our labour, and the sooner the matter is attended to, the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling today. Dr Seward's Diary, 1st of October. It was towards noon when I was awakened by the Professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped to take some of the brooding weight off his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning, or if that you are too occupied, I can go alone, if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who taught philosophy and reason so sound. I had some work to do which pressed, so I told him that if he would go alone, I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep him waiting. So I called an attendant and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. I want him to talk of himself and of his delusion as to the consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous as the flies and spiders which he had just eaten before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said. Your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from the teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work and before long was through, that in hand it seemed at time had been very short indeed. But there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt, he asked politely as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in, my work is finished and I am free. I can go with you now if you like. It is needless, I have seen him. Well, I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room, he was sitting on a stool in the centre, with his elbows on his knees, 
and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. Don't you know me? I asked. His answer was not reassuring. I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theory somewhere else. Damn all sick-headed Dutchmen. Not a word more would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness, as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for his time my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic. So shall I go, if I may, and cheer myself up with a few happy words for that sweet soul, Madam Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakable that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried with our terrible things, but we shall miss her help. It is better so. I agree with you with all my heart, I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. Mrs Harker is best out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But this is no place for a woman, and if she has remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. So Van Helsing has gone to confer with Mrs Harker, and Harker, Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work and we shall meet tonight. Mina Harker's Journal 1st of October. It is strange for me to be kept in the dark as I am today. After Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain manners, and those the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly. I never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house. And yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow. I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this work. And I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me. And now I'm crying like a silly fool. When I know it comes from my husband's great love. And from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all, and lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then if he has feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited today. I suppose it's a reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I didn't feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, to, no matter how right it may be, bring on the very thing which is the most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor Delisi would still be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came. If she hadn't come there in the daytime with me, she wouldn't have walked there in her sleep. If she hadn't gone there at night in her sleep, that monster couldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I'd been crying twice in one morning, I, who never cried on my own account, and whom it has never caused to shed a tear, the dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put on a bold face. If I do feel weepy, he shall never see it. I suppose it's one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of dogs. A lot of queer sounds like praying on a very tumultuous scale from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And there was silence over everything. Silence so profound that it startled me. I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent. The black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. 
Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that in a thin streak of white mist that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house, seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed, I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got up and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading. I was now close up to the house, so I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it was stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognise his tones, some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was a sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes up over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, for except dreams, I didn't remember anything until morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realise where I was and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, but it was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in or continued in dreams. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it was stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognise his tones, some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy. At least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, except the dream. I did not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and quite a little time to realise where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, almost typical of the way that walking thoughts become merged in or continued in dreams. I thought that I was asleep and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands my brain were weighted so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace, and so I slept uneasily and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face and found to my surprise that all was dim around me. The gaslight which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point. But some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs, and even my will, I lay still and endured. That was all. I closed my eyes. I could still see through my eyelids. It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like a smoke, out of the white energy of boiling water, pouring in, not through the window, but through the jointings of the door. And it got thicker and thicker, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see a light of the gas shining like a red eye. And things began to whirl through my brain, just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room. And through it all came the scriptural words, a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. Was it indeed some spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye. At the thought got a new fascination for me, till as I looked at the fire divided, 
and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, just as Lucy told me in her momentary mental wandering when on the cliff the dying sunlight struck the windows of St Mary's Church. Suddenly the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight. And in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr Van Helsing or Dr Seward to prescribe something for me, which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. Tonight I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall tomorrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral. That cannot hurt me for once. And it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 2nd of October, 10pm. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept only, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed. The sleep had not refreshed me, for today I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read or lying down dozing. In the afternoon, Mr Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man, he was very gentle, and when I came away he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I am crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner time, and they all came in tired. I did what I could to brighten them up. I suppose that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said. But I knew that they wanted to tell each other what had occurred to each during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made me up a sleeping draught, which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and I am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleep begins to flirt with me, a new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking. I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. End of chapter 19「Jonathan Harker's Journal First of October, Evening I found Thomas Snelling in his house at Bethnal Green, but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything. The very prospect of beer, which my expected coming had opened to him, had proved too much and he began too early on his expected debauch. I learned, however, from his wife, who seemed a decent poor soul, that he was only the assistant to Smollett, who, of the two mates, was a responsible person. So off I drove to Walworth, and found Mr Joseph Smollett at home, and in his shirt sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He's a decent, intelligent fellow, Distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, and with a headpiece of his own. He remembered all about the incident from the boxes, from a wonderful dog-eared notebook, which he produced for some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hieroglyphical entries in thick, half-obliterated pencil. He gave me the destinations of the boxes. There were, he said, six in the cartload, 
which he took from Carfax, and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End, Newtown, and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. If then the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges of his over London, these places were chosen at the first of delivery, so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east of the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme let alone the city itself in the very heart of fashionable London, in the south-west and west. I went back to Smollett and asked him if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, Well, Governor, you treated me very handsome. i have given him half a sovereign, and I'll tell you all I know. I heard a man by the name of Bloxham say four nights ago in the Air and Hounds in Pincher's Alley as though he'd had his mate done a rare dusty job in an old house at Perfect. There ain't many such jobs in this here, and I'm thinking that maybe Sam Bloxham could tell you something. I asked him if he could tell me where to find it. I told him that if he could get me the address, it would be worth another half sovereign to him. So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. At the door he stopped and said, Look here, Governor. There ain't no sense in me of keeping you here. I may find Sam soon, or I may have. But anyway, he ain't like to be in a way to tell you much tonight. Sam is a rare one, and when he starts on the booze, you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it and put your address on it. I'll find out where Sam is to be found and post it to you tonight. Maybe you won't catch him, but for Sam gets off main early. Never mind the booze the night before. This was all practical, so one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper and to keep the chain. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it. And when Smollett had again faithfully promised to post the address when found, I took my way home. We are on the track anyhow. I'm tired tonight, I want to sleep. Mina is fast asleep and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying, poor dear. I have no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark, and it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way now, and to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm, for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be a hard task after all, for she herself has become reticent on the subject and has not spoken of the Count or his doings ever since we told her of our decision. 2nd of October, evening. A long and trying and exciting day. By the first post, I got my directed envelope with a dirty scrap of paper enclosed on which was written with a carpenter's pencil in a sprawling hand, Sam Bloxham, Corcrans, 4 Porters Court, Bartle Street, Walworth. Ask for the deputite. I got the letter in bed and rose without waking Mina. She looked heavy and sleepy and pale and far from well. I determined not to wake her, but that, when I should return from this new search, I would arrange for her going back to Exeter. I think she would be happier in her own home, with her daily tasks to interest her, than being in here amongst us and in ignorance. I only saw Dr. Seward for a moment and told him where I was off to, promising to come back and tell the rest as soon as I should have found out anything. I drove to Walworth and found with some difficulty Potter's Court. Mr. Smollett's spelling misled me, and I asked for Potter's Court instead of Potter's Court. However, when I found the court, I had no difficulty in discovering Cochoran's lodging house. When I asked the man who came to the door for Depotite, he shook his head and said, I don't know him. There's no such person here. 
Never heard of it in all the blooming days. Don't believe there ain't anybody of that kind living here or anywhere. So I took out the smallest letter, and as I read it, it seemed to me that the lesson of the spelling of the name of the court might guide me. What are you, I asked. I'm a deputy, he answered. I saw at once I was on the right track. Phonetic spelling had again misled me. A half a crown tip put the deputy's knowledge at my disposal. And I learned that Mr Bloxham, who had slept off the remains of his beer on the previous night at Court Corrins, had left for his work at Popular at five o'clock that morning. He could not tell me where the place of work was situated, but he had a vague idea that it was some kind of newfangled warehouse. And with this slender clue, I had to start for Popular. It was twelve o'clock before I got any satisfactory hint of such a building. And this I got at a coffee shop, where some workmen were having their dinner. One of those suggested there was being erected at Cross Angel Street a new cold storage building. And as this suited the condition of a newfangled warehouse, I at once drove to it. An interview with a surly gatekeeper and a surlier foreman, both of whom were appeased with the coin of the realm, put me on the track of Bloxham. He was sent for on my suggesting I was willing to pay his day's wages to his foreman for the privilege of asking him a few questions on a private matter. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I promised to pay for his information, I had given him an earnest. He told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and he had taken from this house to the latter nine great boxes. Main heavy ones, with a horse and cart hired by him for the purpose. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house in Piccadilly, to which he replied, Well, Governor, I forget the number, but it was only a few doors from a big white church, something of the kind, not long built. A dusty old house. Oh, nothing to the dustiness of the house we took the blooming boxes from. How did you get into the houses if they were both empty? There was an old party of what engaged me and waited at the house in Burfley. He helped me to lift the boxes and put them in the dray. Cursed me, but he was the strongest chap I ever struck. And him an old fellow with a white moustache. One that thin you. You'd think he couldn't throw a shadow. How this phrase thrilled through me. Why, well, he took up its end of the boxes thought they were pounds of tea. And me a puffing and a blowing before I could end mine up. Anyhow, I'm no chicken either. How did you get into the house in Piccadilly, I asked. He was there too. He must have started off and got there for me. When I rang at a bell, he opened the door himself and helped me carry the boxes into the hall. The whole nine, I asked. Yeah, there was five in the first load, four in the second. It was main dry work. I don't so well remember how I got home. I interrupted him. Were the boxes left in the hall? Yes, it was a big hall. There was nothing else in it. I made one more attempt to further matters. He didn't have a key. Never used a key or nothing. The old gent, he opened the door. Himself, shut it again when I drove off. Don't remember the last time. But that was the beer. And you can't remember the number of the house. No, sir. But you need have no difficulty about that. It's a high end with a stone front and a bow in front of it. I steps up to the door. I know them steps. I'm going to carry them boxes up with three loafers or come round and earn a copper. The old gent gave him shillings. And then seeing they got so much, they wanted more. But he took one of them by the shoulder. It was like to throw him down the steps till a lot of them went away cussing. I thought that with this description I could find the house. So having paid my friend for his information, I started off for Piccadilly. I'd had a new, painful experience. The Count could, it was evident, handle the earth boxes himself. So, if so, time was precious. For now that he had achieved a certain amount of distribution, he could, by choosing his own time, complete the task unobserved. At Piccadilly Circus, I discharged my cab and walked westward beyond the junior constitution. I came across the house described and satisfied that this was the next of the lairs arranged by Dracula. The house looked as if it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust, 
and the shutters were up, and the framework was black with time, and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that up to lately there had been a large notice board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony I saw there were some loose boards, whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see a notice board intact, as it would perhaps have given the son some clue to the ownership of the house. I remember my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax. I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner, there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was at present nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly site, and nothing could be done, so I went round to the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation. I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers, whom I saw around, if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them had said that he had heard it lately had been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice board of for sale up, and that perhaps Mitchell and Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something, as he thought he had remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager, or to let my informant know or guess too much. So thanking him in a usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk, and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. Having learned the address of Mitchell's Sons and Candy from a directory at the Barclay, I was soon in their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. Having once told me that the Piccadilly House, which throughout our interview he called a mansion, was sold, he considered it my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider, and paused a few seconds before replying, It is sold, sir. Pardon me, I said with equal politeness, but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it. Again he paused longer and raised his eyebrows still more. It is sold, sir, was his laconic reply. Surely, I said, you do not mind letting me know so much. But I do mind, he answered. The affairs of the clients are absolutely safe in the hands of Mitchell, Sons and Candy. This was manifestly a prig of the first water. It was no use arguing with him. I thought I'd best meet him on his own ground, so I said, Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man. Here I handed in my card. In this instance, I am not prompted by curiosity. I act on the part of Lord Godalming, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs, he said. I would like to oblige you if I could, Mr Harper, and especially I would like to oblige his lordship. We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him, when he was the Honourable Arthur Homewood. If you will let me have his lordship's address, I will consult the house on the subject, and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules as to give the required information to his lordship. I wanted to secure a friend and not to make an enemy. So I thanked him, gave the address at Dr. Seward's and came away. It was now dark and I was tired and hungry. I got a cup of tea at the Aerated Bread Company and came down to Perthleet by the next train. I found all the others at home. Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had to keep anything from her, and so cause her inquietude. Thank God this would be the last night of her looking on at our conferences. 
and feeling the sting of our not showing confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seemed somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her. For when any accidental allusion is made, she actually shudders. I'm glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this, our growing knowledge would be torture to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery that we were alone. So after dinner, followed by a little music to save appearances, even amongst ourselves, I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever and clung to me as though she would detain me. But there was much to be talked of and I came away. Thank God the ceasing of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again, I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Helsing said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, and our work is near the end. But if there is some missing, we must search until we find them. Then we shall make our final coup and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat silent. All at once, Mr. Morris spoke. Say, how are we going to get into that house? We got into the other, answered Lord Godalming quickly. Yeah, but Art, this is different. We broke house at Carfax, but we had night and a walled park to protect us. It'd be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night. I confess, I don't know how we're going to get in, unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Maybe we shall know when you get his letter in the morning. Lord Godalming's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to the other of us. Quincy's head is level. The burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we now have a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key basket, as nothing could well be done before morning, as it would be at least advised to wait until Lord Godalming should hear from Mitchells. We decided not to take any active step before breakfast. For a good while we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I'm very sleepy and shall go to bed. Just a line. Minya sleeps soundly and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered into little wrinkles as though she thinks even in her sleep. She is still too pale, but does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. She will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I am sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary, 1st of October. I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them. And as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form a more than interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him, after his repulse of Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds, and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something. So I asked him, what about the flies at these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of a way. Such a smile as would have come the face of Malvolio as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic facilities. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its most logically. So I said quickly, Oh, it's your soul you're after now, is it? His madness fooled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face, as, shaking his head, 
with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him, he said, Oh no, oh no, I want no souls. Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I'm pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, Doctor, if you wish to study Sufeji. This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose. He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh, no, far from it for me to arrogate myself to the attributes of the deity. I am not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerned, things purely terrestrial. Someone in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not at the moment recall Enoch's oppositeness. So I had to ask a simple question. Though I felt that by doing so, I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it. So I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life, and you don't want souls. Why not? I put my question quickly, and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded, for in an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, I don't want any souls, indeed, indeed. I could use them if I had them. They would be of no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face, like a wind sweep on the surface of the water. And doctor, as to life, what is it after all? When you've got all you require, and you know that you'll never want. That is all. I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity, he saw some antagonism in me. For he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time, I saw that for the present it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day, he sent for me. Ordinarily, I would not have come without special reason. But just at present, I am so interested in him that I would gladly make the effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help pass the time. Harker is out following up clues. So are Lord Godalming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study, poring over the record, paired by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details, he will light upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting out in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, What about souls? It was evident that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. What about them yourself? I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all around him and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. I don't want any souls, he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed to be preying on his mind. So I determined to use it to be cruel and only he be kind. So I said, you like life, you want life. Oh yes, but that's all right, you needn't worry about that. But I asked, how are we to get the life without getting the soul also? It seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have sometime when you're flying out there with the souls of thousands 
of the flies and spiders and birds, cats buzzing and twittering and meowing all around you. You've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination. For he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a small boy does when his face is being soaked. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child, only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble on the jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter his mind as well as I could go with him. The first step was to restore confidence. So I asked him, speaking pretty loud, so that he would hear me through his closed ears, would you like some sugar to get your flies round again? He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh he replied, the flies are poor things after all. After a pause he added, but I don't want their souls buzzing round me all the same. Or spiders, I went on. Blow spiders? What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat. Or... He stopped suddenly as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself, this is the second time that he suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Wenfield seemed aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on, as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it, Chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might try as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try to interest me about the lesser carnivora, when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you are talking. He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. I don't want an elephant's soul, or any soul at all, he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, with his eyes blazing, and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. To hell with you and your souls, he shouted. Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain and distract me already without thinking of souls? He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm and said apologetically, Forgive me, Doctor, I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am so worried in my mind, and I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face, and that I am working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat. I want to think, and I cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. It only self-control. So when the attendants came, I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go when the door was closed, and he said with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you've been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over in this man's state. Several points seem to make what the American interviewer calls a story, if one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despite the meaner forms of life altogether, he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically, all these things point to one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, 
burden of the soul, and it is a human life he looks to, and the assurance, merciful God, the Count has been to him. Is there some new scheme of terror afoot? Later, I went after my round to Van Helsing and told him my suspicion. He grew very grave, and after thinking the matter over for a while, asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so. As we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within, singing gaily, as he used to in the time which now seems long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugar as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz in the room. We tried to make him talk on the subject of our previous conversation, but he would not attend. He went on with his singing, just as though we had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away, as ignorant as when we went in. His is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter. Mitchell and Sons and Candy to Lord Godalming, 1st of October. My Lord, we are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg with regard to the desire of your Lordship expressed by Mr. Harker on your behalf to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield. The purchase is a foreign nobleman, Count de Ville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money in notes over the counter, if your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression. Beyond this, we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons and Candy. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd of October. I placed a man in the corridor last night and told him to make an accurate note of any sound he might hear from Renfield's room. I gave him instructions that there should be anything strange at all. He was to call me. After dinner, when we had all gathered round the fire in the study, Mrs. Harker having gone to bed, we discussed the attempts and discoveries of the day. Harker was the only one who had any result. We are in great hopes that his clue may be an important one. Before going to bed, I went round to the patient's room and looked in through the observation trap. He was sleeping soundly, and his heart rose and fell with regular respiration. This morning, the man on duty reported to me that a little after midnight he was restless and kept saying his prayers somewhat loudly. I asked him if that was all. He replied that was all he heard. There was something about his manner so suspicious that I asked him point blank if he had been asleep. He denied sleep but admitted to having dozed for a while. It is too bad that men cannot be trusted unless they are watched. Today Harker is out following up his clue and Art and Quincy are looking after the horses. Godelman thinks that it would be well to have horses in readiness, but when we get the information which we seek, there will be no time to lose. We must sterilise all the imported earth between sunrise and sunset. We shall thus catch the Count at his weakest, without a refuge to fly to. Van Helsing is off to the British Museum, looking up some authorities on ancient medicine. The old physicians took account of such things, which their followers do not accept, and the Professor is searching for witch and demon cures, which may be useful to us later. I sometimes think we must all be mad, and that we shall wake to sanity in straight waistcoats. Later, we have met again. We seem at last to be on the track, and our work tomorrow may be the beginning of the end. I wonder if Renfield's quiet has anything to do with this. His moods have so followed the good doings of the Count that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him in some subtle way. If we could only get some hint as to what has passed in his mind. 
between the time of my argument with him today and his resumption of fly catching. It might afford us a valuable clue. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. Is he? That wild yell seemed to come from his room. The attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had somehow met with some accident. He heard him yell and went to him and found him lying on his face on the floor, all covered with blood. I must go at once. End of chapter 20「Of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Dr. Seward's Diary. 3rd of October. Let me put down with exactness all that happened as well as I can remember it since I last made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness, I must proceed. When I came into Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor on his left side in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of that unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant, who was kneeling beside the body, said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralysed. How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered. His brows were gathered in as he said, I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head on the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at the Eversfield Asylum before anyone could lay hands on her. And I suppose he might have broke his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward kink. But for the life of me, I cannot imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head. If his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks on it. I said to him, go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without an instant delay. The man ran off and within a few minutes, the professor in his dressing gown and slippers appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him for a moment and then turned to me. I think he recognised the thought in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant, Ah, a sad accident. He will need very careful watching and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain here, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He'd evidently been thinking and had his mind made up, but almost before he looked at the patient, he whispered to me, send the attendant away. He must be alone with him when he becomes conscious after the operation. So I said, I think that will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go to your round and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual elsewhere. The man withdrew and we went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought for a moment and said, we must reduce the pressure to get back to normal conditions, as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so we must trepine it at once, or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door, and I went over and opened it. 
and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy, in pyjamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing to tell him of an accident, so I woke Quincy, or rather called for him, as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open till they had entered, then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient, and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what's happened to him, poor devil? I told him briefly and I they expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed with Godalming beside him. We all watched in patience. We shall wait, said Van Helsing, just long enough to fix the best spot for trephining, so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing. The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking feeling in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words that Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think, but the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then there would follow a prolonged stertorous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Benured as I was to sick beds and death, the suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples it sounded like the blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonising. I looked at my companions, one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word he made the operation. For a few moments the breathing continued to be stertorous. And then there came a breath so prolonged that it seemed as though it would tear up in his chest. Suddenly his eyes opened and became fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments and it softened into a glad surprise. And from the lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively. As he did so, said, I'll be quiet, Doctor. Tell him to take off the straight waistcoat. I have had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen, and it smarts dreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort, his eyes seemed to grow glassy, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave tone, Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he said, That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is for you to be here. Give me some water. My lips are dry. I shall try to tell you I dreamed. He stopped and seemed fainting. I yelled quietly to Quincy, the brandy, it's in my study, quick. He flew and returned with a glass. The decanter of brandy and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval. When he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonised confusion which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself, it was no dream, but all a grim reality. 
and his eyes moved round the room, and they caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently on the end of the bed. He went on. If I were not sure already, I would know from them. For an instant his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he was bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said hurriedly, and with more energy than he had yet displayed, Quick, Doctor, quick, I am dying. I feel that I have but a few minutes, and I must go back to death, or worse. Wet my lips with brandy again, I have something I must say before I die, or before my poor crushed brain dies anyhow. Thank you. It was that night after you left me when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was the same then, except in that way as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realised where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself, and nodded slightly and said, Go on. In a low voice, Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist. I had seen him often before. But he was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce, like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth, the sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight, and he turned to look back over the belt of trees where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I know he wanted to, just as he had wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining. The great big fat ones with steel and sapphire on their wings, and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously, The Acherontia, Atotropus of the Stringers, what you call the Death's Head Moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, rats, rats, rats. Hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one alive, and dogs to eat them. Cats too, all lives, all red blood, with years of life in it. Not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled away beyond the dark trees in his house. He beckoned me to the window, and I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming like the shape of a flame of fire. And then he moved in the mist to the right and left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats with their eyes blazing red, like his only smaller. He held up his hand and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, All these lives I will give to you, I and many more, and greater throughout countless ages if you will fall down and worship me. And then a red cloud like the colour of blood seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash, saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone. He slid into the room through the sash, and it was only an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack, and it stood before me in all her size and splendour. His voice was weaker, but I moistened his lips with the brandy again, and he continued. But it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval, for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on, do not interrupt him. He cannot go back, and maybe could not proceed at all, if once he had lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day long I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly. And when the moon got up, I was pretty angry with him. When he slid in through the window, though it was shut and did not even knock, I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face 
looked out of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place, and I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that somehow Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him so that he could not see them. But where they could hear better, they were both silent. But the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on, without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea after the teapot had been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word, and he went on. I didn't know that she was still here till she spoke, and she didn't look the same. I don't care for pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers had all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he'd been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered as I did. But we remained otherwise still, so when he came tonight, I was ready for him. When I saw the mist stealing in, I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, times anyhow, I resolved to use my power. I and he felt it too, for he had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win. For I didn't mean him to take any more of her life, till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the worst now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed the same as we were the other night, but lose no time. There is not an instant to spare. There was no need to put our fear, nay, our convictions into words. We shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor, he pointed to them significantly, and he said, They shall never leave me. They shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. This is no common enemy that we deal with. Alas, alas, that dear Madame Mina should suffer. He stopped. His voice was breaking. I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, Shall we disturb her? We must, said Van Helsing grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it in. May it not frighten her terribly. It is unusual to break into a lady's room. Van Helsing said solemnly, You are always right, but this is life and death. All chambers are alike to the doctor. And even were they not, they are all as one to me tonight. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, you put your shoulder down and shove, and you too, my friends, now. He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it with a crash, and it burst open. We almost fell headlong into the room. The professor did actually fall, and I saw him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily, as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed facing towards was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her side stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we all recognised the Count, in every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand, he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, 
keeping them away with her arms at full tension. The right hand gripped her by the neck, forcing her down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast, which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth champed together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed, as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time the Professor had gained his feet, and was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further he cowered as we lifted our crucifixes and advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed as a great black cloud sailed across the sky. When the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which with the recoil from its bursting open, had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears to my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in a helpless attitude of disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips, cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror, and she put before her face her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came a low, desolate wail, which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, while Art, looking at her face for an instant, despairingly ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor, such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him on the face. His wife, all the while, holding her face between her hands, and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine, and as I looked, I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this, but at the instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness and turned to the bed. On his face there might well be was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement and turned to him with her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, putting her elbows together, her hands held before her face, and shuddered to the bed beneath her shook. In God's name, what does this mean? Harker cried out. Dr. Seward, Dr. Van Helsing, what is it? What's happened? What's wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? What does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this? and raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. Oh, good God, help us, help her, oh, help her. With a quick movement, he jumped from the bed and began to pull on his clothes. All the man in him awake at the need of our instant exertion. What has happened? Tell me all about it, he cried without pausing. Dr. Van Housing, you love me, or I know. Oh, do something to save her. It cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him. His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, 
No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough tonight, God knows, with the dread of this harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he, yielding to her, she pulled him down, sitting on the bed, and clung to him fiercely. The professor held up his little golden crucifix and said with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear, we are here. And whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight, and we must be calm and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down the head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the sin open wound in her neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back with a low wail and whispered amongst choking sobs, Unclean, unclean, I must touch him or kiss him no more. Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have most cause to fear. To this he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mina. It is a shame for me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything has ever come between us. He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while her sobs became less frequent and more faint. And then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness, which I felt tried his nervous power to the utmost, and now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been. I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness. But his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed, as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position, with her mouth to the open wound on his breast. It interested me, even at that moment, to see that whilst the face of white-set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons, and Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean that if we were to take advantage of their coming to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other, and from themselves. So on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked them what they had seen or done, to which Lord Godalming answered, I could not see him anywhere in the passage, or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however, he stopped suddenly, looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is knowing all. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could only have been for a few seconds, he made a rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering amongst the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph were too thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there's another copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs, but I could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there, except... Again he paused. Go on, said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head and moistening his lips with his tongue, added, except that the poor fellow is dead. Mrs. Harker raised her head. Looking from one to the other of us, she said solemnly, God's will be done. I could not but feel that Art was keeping back something. But as I took it in that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. 
It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. But I thought it well to know, if possible, where the Count could go when he left the house. I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east, and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow. He said the latter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes, there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand very tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, And now, Madam Mina, poor dear, poor dear Madam Mina, tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you will be pained. But it is need that we know all. For now, more than ever, has all work to be done quick and sharp, and in deadly earnest. The day is close to us that it must end all, if it may be so. And now is the chance that we may live and learn. Poor dear lady shivered. I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly and held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his. After stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm thrown around her protectingly. After a pause, in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible f fancies began to crowd upon my mind, all of them connected with death and vampires, with blood and pain and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned as she turned to him and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong and help me through the horrible task. If only you knew what an effort it is to me to tell you of this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to work with my will if it was to do me any good. So I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not waked me, for he lay by my side when I next remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed. But I forget now if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I shall show you later. I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught, and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then indeed my heart sank within me, beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather as if the mist had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others. The waxen face, the high aquiline nose, on which the light fell in a thin white line, parted red lips with the sharp white teeth showing between the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset in the windows of St Mary's Church at Whitby. I knew too the red scar on his forehead where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out only that I was paralysed. In the pause he spoke a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eye. I was appalled, and I was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder, and holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment towards my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time, or the second. 
but your reins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered, and strangely enough, I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it is a part of the horrible curse that such is when his touch is on his victim. And oh my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him, pitying me, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted, I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with the fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly. And so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my designs. You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full long what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for closer to home. Whilst they played wits against me, against me, who commanded nations and intrigued for them and fought for them, hundreds of years before they were born, I was count on my own. And you, their best beloved one, are now to be flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my bountiful winepress for a while and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You should be avenged in turn, for not one of them shall minister you to your needs. But as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me, now you shall come to my call. When my brain says come to you, you shall cross the land or sea to do my bidding, and to that end this. With that, he pulled open his shirt and with his long, sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of the... Oh, my God, my God, what have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I, who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness all my days, God pity me. Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken, and everything became more clear. Harker was still quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a grey look, which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair, till we can meet again together and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of Dracula by Bram Stoker。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Jonathan Harker's Journal, 3rd of October. As I must do something or go mad, I write this diary. It is now six o'clock and we are to meet in the study in half an hour and take something to eat. The Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward agreed that if we do not eat, we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All big and little must go down. Perhaps at the end of the little things may teach us most. The teaching, big or little, 
could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with the tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested, that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us up to the end. The end. Oh, my God, what end? To work, to work. When Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing Paul Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Seward told us that when he and Dr. Van Helsing had gone down to the room below, they had found Renfield lying on the floor all in a heap. His face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of the neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down, he confessed to half dozing, when he heard loud voices in the room. Then Renfield had called out loudly several times, God, God, God. After that there was a sound of falling, and when he entered the room he found him lying on the floor, face down, just as the doctors had seen him. Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices, or a voice, and he said that he could not say that at first it had seemed to him as if there were two, but there was no one in the room, it could only have been one. He could swear to it if required, but the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Seward said to us when we were alone that he did not wish to go into the matter. The question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought that on the attendant's evidence, he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from bed. In case the coroner should demand it, there would be a formal inquest necessarily to the same result. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, the very first thing we decided was that Mina should be in full confidence, that nothing of any sort, no matter how painful, should be kept from her. She herself agreed as to its wisdom, and it was pitiful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful and in such a depth of despair. There must be no concealment, she said. Alas, we have had too much already, and besides there is nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than I've already endured, and I suffer now. Whatever may happen, it must be of a new hope or new courage to me. Van Helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke, and said suddenly but quietly, But dear Madam Mina, are you not afraid, not for yourself, but for the others from yourself, after what has happened? Her face grew in set lines, but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr, as she answered, Ah, oh, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still. For each in our own way we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity, as though she were simply stating a fact. Because if I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would not kill yourself, he asked hoarsely. I would. If there were no friend who loved me, who would save me such a pain, and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her, and put his hand on her head and said solemnly, my child, there is such an one, if it were for your good. For myself, I could hold it into my account with God to find such a euthanasia for you, even at the moment, if it were best. Nay, were it safe, but my child. For a moment he seemed choked, and a great sob rose in his throat as he gulped it down and went on. There are here some who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all by your own, until the other, who has fouled your sweet life, is true dead. You must not die, for if he is still with the quick undead, your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live. You must struggle and strive to live, though death would seem a boon unspeakable. You must fight death himself, though he come to you in pain or joy, by the day or night, in safety or in peril, 
On your living soul I charge you that you do not die, nay, nor think of death until this great evil be past. The poor deer grew white as death, and shocked and shivered as I had never seen a quicksand shake and shiver at the incoming of the tide. We were all silent, but we could do nothing. At length she grew more calm, and turning to him said sweetly, but oh so sorrowfully, she held out her hand. I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so. Till, if it may be in his good name, this horror may have passed away from me. She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her. And we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe, and all the papers or diaries and phonographs we might hereafter use, and was to keep the record as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do, if pleased could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared for an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, at our meeting after our visit to Carfax, we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count may have guessed our purpose and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such an effort with regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more in all probability, he does not know that such power exists to us as can sterilise his lairs so he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition that when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today then is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he goes through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so we have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilise them. So we shall, if we have not yet catch him and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and destroying shall be done in time. Sure. Here I started up, for I could not contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds to preciously laden with Mina's life and happiness were flying from us, since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand, warningly. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said. In this, the quickest way home is the longest way, so your proverb say. We shall act and act with desperate quick when the time has come. But think in all probable the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. The Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them he will have deeds of purchase, keys and other things. He will have paper that he writes on. He will have his book of checks. There are many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place so central? so quiet, where he come and go by the front or back at all hour, when in the very vast, when in the very vast, vast of the traffic there is none to notice. We shall go there and search that house, and when we learn what it holds, then we'll do what our friend Arthur call in his phrases of hunt, stop the earth, and so we run down our old fox. Is that not so hard? And let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting precious, precious time. The professor did not move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police, where will they be and what will they say? I was staggered, for I knew that if he wished to delay, he had a good reason for it. So I said as quietly as I could, don't wait more than we need be. You know, I'm sure, what torture I am in. Ah, my child, that I do, and indeed there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. 
But just think, what can we do until all the world be at movement? Then will come our time. I have thought and thought, and it seems to me the simplest way is the best of all. Now we wish to get into the house, but we have no key, is it not so? I nodded. Now suppose that you were in truth the owner of that house, and could still get in it, and think there was to you no conscience as the housebreaker. What would you do? I should get a respectable locksmith and tell him to set to work to pick the lock for me. And your police, they would interfere, would they not? Oh no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then he looked at me as keenly as he spoke, and in all doubt is a conscience of the employer and a belief of your policeman as to whether or no that employer has a good conscience or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever, oh so clever, in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such a matter. No, my friend Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this your London or of any city in the world. And if you do it, such as things are rightly done, and at the time such things are rightly done, no one will interfere. I have read of a gentleman who owned so fine a house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and lock up his house, some burglar came and broke the window at the back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in the front and walk out and in through the door, before the very eyes of the police. He then have an auction in that house and advertise it, he put up a big notice, and when the day come, he set off by a great auctioneer all the goods of the other man who owned them. Then he go to a builder and sell in the house, making an agreement that if he pull it down and take away all within a certain time, and your police and other authority help him all they can. And when that owner came back from his holiday in Switzerland, he find only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done en règle, and in our work we shall be en règle too. We shall not go so early that the policemen, who have then little to think of, shall deem it strange, but we shall go after ten o'clock, when there are many about, and such things would be done were we indeed owners of the house. I could not but see how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed. A thought, there was hope in such good counsel. Van Helsing went on. When once within the house, we may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there, whilst the rest find the other places, where there be more earth boxes, Bermondsey and Mile End. Lord Godalming stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. It's a capital idea to have ready in case we don't want to go a horseback in. But don't you think that one of your snappy carriages, with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walworth or Mile End, would attract too much attention for our purposes? It seems to me that we ought to take cabs when we go south or east, and then leave them somewhere near the neighbourhood where we're going to. Friend Quincy is right, said the Professor. His head is what you call in plain with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no peoples to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see that the exigency of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experiences of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away showing her teeth in somewhat of a prominence. I did not mention this last, lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. As yet there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time as yet was short, and there was time for fear. When we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts, and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand, lest he should find it out too soon. We should thus be still ahead of him in our work of destruction, 
and his presence in his purely material shape, and at his weakest might give us some new clue. As to the disposal of forces, it was suggested by the Professor that after our visit to Carfax we should all enter the house of Piccadilly, that the two doctors and I should remain there, whilst Lord Godalming and Quincy found the lairs at Walworth and Mile End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the Professor urged that the Count might appear in Piccadilly during the day. If so, we might be able to cope with him, then and there. At any rate, we may be able to follow him in force. To this plan I strenuously objected, and as far as my going was concerned, I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina. I thought that my mind was made up on the subject, but Mina would not listen to my objection. She said that there might be some law matter in which I could be useful, that among the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experiences in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. And she said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes, guard me, as well alone as with anyone present. So I started up, crying out, Then in God's name let us come at once, for we are losing time. The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why, I ask? You forget, he said, with an actually a smile. But last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late. Did I forget? Shall I ever? Can I ever? Can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance. The pain overmastered her, and she put her hands before her face and shuddered while she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madame Mina, he said, dear, dear Madame Mina, Alas, that I, of all people, who so reverence you, should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so. But you will forget it, will you not? He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand, and looking at him through her tears, said hoarsely, No, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember, and with it I have so much memory of you. That is sweet, though I take it all together. Now you must all be going soon. Breakfast is ready. You must eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other. And Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dears, we go forth on our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed as we were on the night when we first visited our enemy's lair, armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? We all assured him, then all is well. Now, Madam Mina, you are in any case quite safe here until the sunset, and before then we shall return, if we shall return, but before we go let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, so that he may not enter. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it, it had burned into the flesh, as though it had been a piece of white hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. 
but the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees in the floor in an agony of abasement. Pulling her beautiful hair over her face, as the leper of his old mantle, she wailed out, Unclean, unclean, even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until judgment day. They all paused. I had thrown myself beside her in an agony of helpless grief. I put my arms round her, held her tight. For a few minutes, our sorrowful hearts beat together, whilst the friends around us turned away, their eyes that ran tears silently. Then Van Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling he was in the same way inspired and was stating things outside himself. It may be that you may have to bear that mark till God himself see fit as he most surely shall on the judgment day to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he has placed thereon. And oh, Madam Mina, my dear, my dear, we who love you be there to see. When that red scar, the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. For surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross, as his son did, in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure, and that we ascend to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through tears and blood, through doubts and fears, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his words and comfort, and they made for resignation. Mina and I felt so and simultaneously we took hold of one of the old man's hands, bent over and kissed it. And then without a word we all knelt down together and holding hands swore to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom, each in his own way, we loved. And we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start. I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind. If we find that Mina must be a vampire in the end, and she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus, in old times, one vampire meant many, just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble and found all things the same as on the first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay, there was any ground for such fear as we already knew. Had our minds not been made up and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our task. We found no papers or any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as they had been when we had seen them last. Dr Van Housing said to us solemnly as we stood before them, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilise this earth, so sacred of holy memories, that he has brought from a far distant land for such fell use, he has chosen this earth because it had been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we will make it more holy still. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown over. The earth smelt musty and close, but we did not somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and shutting down the lid began to screw it home. We aided him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them, to all appearance. But each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the Professor said solemnly, So much is already done. If 
it may be that with all the others we can be so successful, and the sunset of this evening may shine on Madame Mina's forehead, all as white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn on our way back to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her and nodded to tell her that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply to show that she understood. The last I saw, she was waving her hand in farewell. It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station and just caught the train which was steaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godalming said to me, Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You'd better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty, for under the circumstances it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house. For you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger, even of odium, but he went on, besides, it will attract less attention if there are not too many of us. My title will make it all right with a locksmith and with any policeman that may come along. You had better go with Jack and the Professor and stay in the Green Park. Somewhere in sight of the house, and when you see the door open and the smith has gone away, do all you come across. We shall be on the lookout for you and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Godalming and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the Green Park. My heart beat as I saw the house on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition amongst its more lively and spruce-looking neighbours. We sat down on a bench with a good view and began to smoke cigars, so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length we saw a four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in a leisurely fashion, got Lord Godalming and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman, who touched his hat and drove away. Together the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godalming pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to a policeman who had just then sorted along. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man kneeling down placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools, which he produced to lay beside him in an orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked into the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers made some remark. Lord Godalming smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys, selecting one of them, and began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second, then a third. All at once the door opened under a slight push for him and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still, my own cigar burnt furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently as we saw the workman come out and bring his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees whilst he fitted a key to the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godalming, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, beside whom stood Lord Godalming lighting a cigar. The place smells so vilely, said the latter as we came in. It did indeed smell vilely, like the old chapel at Carfax. And with our previous experience, it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with, and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth, 
Eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over and would never be until we should have found the missing box. First we opened the shutters of the window, which looked out across this narrow stone flagged yard at the blank face of the stable, pointed to look like a front of a miniature house. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them, one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining room contained any effects which might belong to the Count, so we proceeded to minutely examine them. They lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining room table. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly House in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the houses at Mile End and Bermondsey, notepaper, envelopes, pen, ink, all were covered up in a thin wrapping paper to keep them from dust. There was also a clothes brush and a comb, a jug and a basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last one, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and south, took with them the keys in a great bunch and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return or the coming of the Count. End of chapter 22Chapter 23 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Dr. Seward's Diary, 3rd of October. The time seemed terrible long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. The Professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficial purpose by the side glances at which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man, with a strong, youthful face, full of energy and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man, whose white hair matches well with the hollow, burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact, in fact. He's like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation, for, if all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow, I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his, the Professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances of absorbing interest, so well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again since they came into my hands all the papers relating to this monster. And the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity utterly stamp him out. Although there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it, as I learned from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest. He was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, alchemist, which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to tend to Schulemans, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well, in him the brain power survived the physical death, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind, he has been and, and is only a child. But he is growing, and some things that were childish for the first time 
are now of man's nature. He is experimenting and doing it well. And if it had not been that we had crossed his path, he would be yet. He may be yet, if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of beings whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, This is all arraigned against us, my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us defeat him. He has all along since his coming been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child brain of his is working. Well, for us, it is as yet a child brain. Or had he dared at first to attempt certain things, he would long ago be beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and a man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and go slow. Festina lente may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily, or to be more plain to me, perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how of late this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally, how he has been making use of the zephagious patient to effect his entry into friend John's home? For your vampire, though all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must make at the first entry when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most extraordinary experiments. Do we not see how, in the first of all those so great boxes, were moved by others? He knew not then, but that it must be so. By all the time that so great a child brain of his was growing, he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So he began to help, and then when he found out that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone. And so he progressed, and he scattered these graves of him, and none but he knows where they are hidden. He may have intended to bury them deep in the ground, so that only he can use them in the night, or at such a time as he can change his form. They do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding places. But, my child, do not despair. His knowledge come to him just too late. All of his lairs, but one, be sterilised. As for him, and before the sunset, this shall be so. Then he have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning so that we might be sure. If there is not more at stake here for us than for him, then why would we not be even more careful than him? By my clock it is one hour already. If all be well, friend Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure if slow and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst he was speaking, we were startled by a knock on the hall door. The double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out into the hall with one impulse, and Van Helsing, holding up his hand to us to keep silence, stepped up to the door and opened it. The boy handed a dispatch. The professor closed the door again, and after looking at the direction, opened and read aloud. Look out for D. He is just now, 12.54, come from Carfax, hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going the round and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish for at the moment may be our undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered hotly, except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Oh, hush, hush, my child, said Van Helsing. God does not purchase souls in this wise. And the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild words. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause and today shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today this vampire 
is limit to the powers of man. Until sunset he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one. And there are yet some times before he can hither come. But he never so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given by by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the Professor's heart and mind beat loudly. We looked at each other and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, spiritual in the left hand, mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch and, holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shone upon our faces when on the step close to the door we saw Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris. They came in quickly and closed the door behind them, the former saying as they moved along the hall, It's all right, we found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all. Destroyed, asked the Professor, for him. We were silent for a moment, and then Quincy said, There's nothing to do but wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset. He will be here before long now, said Van Helsing, who had been consulting his pocketbook. Nota bene, in Madame's telegram he went south from Carfax. That means he went across the river and he could only do so at the slack of tide, which should be something before one o'clock. That he went south has meaning for us. He is as yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax to the first place where he would suspect interference least. He must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him, for he is not here already, shows that he meant to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush, there is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we could all hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserted itself, or in all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a glance round the room, he at once laid out our plan of attack. Without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in a position, Van Helsing, Harker and I were just behind the door, so that when it was opened the Professor could guard it, whilst we two stepped between the incomer and the door. Godalming behind and Quincy in front stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the windows. We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leapt into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who with a quick movement threw himself before the door, leading into the room at the front of the house. The Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl, passed over his face, showing the eye teeth long and pointed, but the evil smile has quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed as with a single impulse we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organised plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were going to do. I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail us anything, Harker, evidently, meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great cookery knife, made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one. 
Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less, and the trenchant blade had shorn through his heart. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression on the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward with a protective impulse. Holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand, I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, anger and hellish rage which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm ere his blow could fall, and grasping a handful of money from the floor, dashed across the room as he threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Through the sound of the shivering glass, I could hear the ting of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him spring unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, crossed the flag yard and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. You think to baffle me with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You should be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without place to rest. But I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures to do my bidding, and to be my jackals when I want to breed. Yeah. With a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut, the first of us to speak was the Professor. As realising the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved toward the hall. We have learned something, much, notwithstanding his brave words, he fears us. He fear time, he fear want. For if not, why he hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You follow quick. You are hunters of a wild beast and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him. It's so that he returned. As he spoke, he put the money remaining in his pocket, took the vital deeds in the bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with a match. Godalming and Morris had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself from the window to follow the Count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open, there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make an inquiry at the back of the house, but the mews was deserted, and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and the sunset was not far off. We had to recognise that our game was up. With heavy hearts, we agreed with the Professor when he said, Let's go back to Madame Mina. Poor, poor dear Madame Mina. All we can do just now is done, and we can there at least protect her. But we need not despair. There is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down now, and again he gave a low groan that he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. With sad hearts, we came back to my house, where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us, with an appearance of cheerfulness, which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw her faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two, her eyes were closed, as if she were in a secret prayer. And then she said cheerfully, I can never thank you all enough. 
Oh, my poor darling, as she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor dear head here and rest it, and all will be well, my dear. God will protect us, if he so will, in his good intent. The poor fellow groaned. There was no place of words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctionary supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was perhaps the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast, or the sense of companionship may have helped us. But anyhow, we were all less miserable, and saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we all told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times, when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and read at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the Count so regularly, she clung to her husband's arm, and held it as tight as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might be done. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought right up to the present time. Then, without letting go of her husband's hand, she stood up among us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman, in all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with a red scar on her forehead, of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding our teeth, remembering whence and how it came, her loving kindness against our grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, knowing that so far as symbols went, she, with all her goodness and purity and faith, was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the word sounded like music on her lips. It was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you, all my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, and you must destroy, even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed in his worser part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him were shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively the clasp of his white hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain, which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leapt to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him my hand for just long enough to destroy that earthly life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul for ever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush, hush, in the name of the good God, don't say such things, Jonathan, my husband or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking this all a long day of it, that perhaps some day I too may need such pity, and that some other like you, with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband, my husband, indeed, I would have spared you such a thought, had there been another way. But I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words, except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. Oh God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept too, to see her sweeter counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms round her, hid his face in the folds of her dress and Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their God. Before they retired, the Professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. 
She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly, for her husband's sake, seemed tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell, which either of them was to sound in case of an emergency when they had retired. Quincy, Godalming, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us should be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I too shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 3rd or 4th of October, close to midnight. I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep, in some sort of blind belief that to wake would be to find things changed, and that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted, we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that there was one earth box remained, and the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years, and in the meantime, the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. I know that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor wrong darling. I love her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God will not permit the world to be the poorer by the loss of such a creature. This is hope to me. We're all drifting reefwards now, and our faith is the only anchor. Thank God Mina is sleeping and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams might be like, with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm with my seeing since the sunset, and for a while there came over her face a repose which is like the spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow I think it has a deeper meaning. I am not sleeping myself, though I am weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until... Later, I must have fallen asleep for I was awakened by Mina, who was sitting up in bed with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for we did not leave the room in darkness. She placed a warning hand over my mouth, and now she whispered in my ear, Hush, there's someone in the corridor. I got up softly and, crossing the room, gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence as he whispered to me. Hush, go back to bed. It's all right. One of us will be here all night. We don't mean to take any chances. His look and gesture forbade discussion. So I came back and told Mina. She sighed. Positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor pale face as she put her arms round me and said softly, Oh, thank God for good brave men. With a sigh, she sank back again to sleep. I write this now as I am not sleepy, though I must try again. 4th of October, morning. Once again during the night I was wakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep, for the grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flame was like a speck rather than a disc of light. She said to me hurriedly, Go call the Professor, I want to see him at once. Why? I asked. I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotise me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest, the time is getting close. I went to the door. Dr Seward was resting on the mattress, and seeing me, he sprang to his feet. Is anything wrong? he asked in alarm. No, I replied, but Mina wants to see Dr Van Helsing at once. I will go, he said, and hurried off to the professor's room. In two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing gown, and Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door asking questions. When the professor saw Mina, his smile, a positive smile, ousted the anxiety of his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, Oh, my dear Madam Mina, this is indeed a change. 
see friend jonathan we've got our dear madam mina as of old back to us today and turning to her he said cheerfully and what am i to do for you for at this hour you do not want me for nothings i want you to hypnotize me she said do it before the dawn for i feel that then i can speak and speak freely be quick for the time is short without a word he motioned her to sit up in bed looking fixedly at her he commenced to make passes in front of her from over the top of her head downward with each hand in turn mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes during which my own heart beat like a trip hammer for i felt that some crisis was at hand gradually her eyes closed and she sat stock still only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive the professor made a few more passes and then stopped I could see that his forehead was covered with great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes, but she did not seem the same woman. There was a far away look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned me to bring the others in. They came in on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed looking up. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice, speaking in a low, level tone which would not break the current of her thoughts. Where are you? The answer came in a neutral way. I do not know. Sleep has no place. It can call its own. For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up, and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant, the professor spoke again. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. It was as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in Professor's patient voice. A lapping of water is gurgling by. A little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. When you are on a ship... We all looked at each other, trying to glean something from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping over the head as they run about. There is a creaking of a chain and a loud tinkle as the check of the captain. As the check of the captain falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am. I am still. Oh, so still. It's like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath, as of one sleeping, and the eyes closed again. By the time the sun had risen, we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders, and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments, and then with a long sigh awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. Have I been talking in my sleep? was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation, and she said, Then there is not a moment to lose. It may not yet be too late. Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming started for the door, but the professor's calm voice called them back. Stay, my friends. That ship, wherever it was, was weighing anchor while she spoke. And there are many ships weighing anchor at the moment in your so great port of London. Which of them it is that you seek? God be thanked that we have once again a clue. But whither it may lead us we know not. We have been blind, somewhat blind after the manner of men, since we can look back and see what we might have seen. Looking forward, have we been able to see what we might have seen? But alas, that sentence is a puddle, is it not? We can know now what was in the Count's mind, when he seized the money, though Jonathan's so fierce a knife put him in the danger that even he dread. 
He meant escape. Hear me? Escape. He saw that with one earth box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have to take his last earth board box upon ship and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no, we follow him. Tally ho, his friend Arthur would say, when he put on his red frock. Our old fox is wily, oh so wily, and we must follow with wile. I too am wily, and I think his mind in a little while. In the meantime we may rest in peace, for there are waters between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not if he would, unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide. See, and the sun just rose, and all day to sunset is to us. Let us take a bath and dress, and have breakfast which we all need, and which we can eat comfortably, since he be not in the same land with us. Mina looked at him appealingly as she asked, But why need we seek him further when he has gone away from us? He took her hand and patted it as he replied, Ask me nothings as yet. When we have breakfast, then I answer all questions. He would say no more, and we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute, and then said sorrowfully, Because, my dear Madam Mina, now more than ever we must find him, even if we have to follow him to, to the jaws of hell. She grew paler, as she asked faintly, Why? Because, he answered solemnly, he can live for centuries, and you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. End of chapter 23Chapter 24 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. Seward's phonograph diary spoken by Van Helsing. This to Jonathan Harker. You are to stay with your dear Madam Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so. For it is not a search, but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that, so you will know, what we four know already. For I have tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have somewheres. For this he took the money. For this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb, that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. 